my name is Heidi Torek. I'm an associate professor in the History and Public Policy uh, School at UBC and the director of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, which is one of the two centers, along with the Center for Japanese uh, Research, the Konwakai Chair in Japanese Research, Eve Tabergian, and we are co-organizing uh, this event. And this event is the first in a three-part series entitled Global Conversations About digital disruptions. And we'll have two upcoming events, one in December on data and one next February on security. So please stay tuned for both of those. And um, so before we begin, uh, that we'll have a land acknowledgement. Um, so I would like to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples who have called this area where, where I am located home for many thousands of years and continue to do so today and on whose land we have the privilege of gathering and learning. Now, I know we have people joining us from all around the world, so I'd like to invite you to reflect on the indigenous lands that you are located on today. So as I mentioned, this uh, series is a collaboration between the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions and the Konwakai Chair in Japanese Research, who is currently Eve Tibergian. So as you might expect from that collaboration, we are interested in incorporating East Asian perspectives we are interested in having global perspectives on thinking about various forms of digital disruptions. And so it seemed immediately clear to us that if we were going to do an event about elections, it was going to be one that focused on um, four of, I think, the, the most interesting and important elections that have been happening in 2022 in the Philippines, South Korea, Kenya, and the uh, ongoing elections in Brazil. So we have four fantastic panelists who will be talking about those four elections, and I'll be introducing them in a moment. Just a few logistical notes uh, before we get to the speakers and the run of show for today. Um, so the first thing is, uh, if you would like to turn on live transcription, you can do so using the function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Live transcription has been enabled. Uh, the second thing is that we very much welcome questions from the participants. Please pose them, though, in the Q&A section. Uh, you don't have to use your cameras or microphones to ask questions. Type them into the chat, uh, the Q&A portion of the chat, whenever they occur to you. So I'll be monitoring that Q&A window and I'll be asking questions just using uh, your first name. Or if you don't want me to use your, your first name, uh, feel free to note that in your question as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Panthea Pormalek, who has been a uh, stellar behind the scenes organizer of this uh, webinar. So thanks very much to Panthea, who's in also ensuring, along with Tanya and Rashi, uh, that this event goes smoothly uh, today. So now let me introduce our four speakers. Uh, first, we have Ivar Hartman, who is an associate professor of law at INSPER Institute for Education and Research in Sao Paulo, Brazil. His teaching and research interests cover topics of cyber law, empirical legal research, and constitutional law. And I've had the pleasure of working with Ivar for, for a couple of years on a couple of projects related to uh, global platform governance. Uh, secondly, we have Dr. Ain Sinpeng, who is a senior lecturer and a DECRA, a DECRA fellow in the discipline of government and international relations at the University of Sydney. An award-winning author and educator, Aim is an expert on social media and politics in Southeast Asia, and is also a, a graduate from uh, UBC. Uh, third, we have uh, Andrew Lungati, who is a technologist, community builder, and open source software advocate. She's passionate about building and using appropriate technology tools to impact the lives of marginalized groups. She is executive director at Ushahidi, a global nonprofit technology company that helps communities quickly collect and share information that enables them to raise voices, inform decisions, and influence change. And Angela wins the award uh, for having the most awkward time to, to do this panel, for it is just after three in the morning, and we are tremendously grateful to Angela for, for getting up and, and being with us. We very much appreciate it. Um, last but not least, we have Jade Kim, an Associate Professor of Communication and Director of Undergraduate Studies in Communication at Texas A&M International University. She specialized in global media industries and Korean media culture and practice. Kim is currently working on her monograph, looking into how connections and movements driven by technologies allow peripheral actors to tackle the ideological amalgamation of Western and global culture. And you'll see that we've also attempted to bring people together who are looking at these questions of elections and social media from different disciplinary backgrounds as well. And, and in the case of Jade, I think bringing in this really important question of pop culture, which is so often ignored when we talk about elections. 
So when uh, Eve and I were thinking about putting together this panel, we really thought of three main aims as to why we wanted to bring these elections uh, together. Um, the first was that we really wanted to assess the level of disruption created by digital platforms, including social media platforms, in democratic elections and democratic outcomes in different national contexts. Um, the second was that we thought it was very important to actually compare between national examples to understand what is specific to each context and what are broader patterns. Often panels about elections will feature one election that makes it very difficult to actually know what is specific to that one election and what are actually broader patterns. And by bringing together four panelists who are experts on different places, I hope we can uh, start inch towards some answers around that comparative question. And then thirdly, we wanted to see, well, can we identify any of the factors that really influence the level of disruption that might be caused by digital platforms and to tease out which factors in the digital realm might affect electoral and democratic outcomes. Um, so we set ourselves a whole host of uh, fascinating tasks. And in terms of figuring out how we're going to get there, we are first going to have a discussion that's, that's moderated by me uh, with our four panelists for about 35 to 40 minutes. A couple of questions that, that will lay some groundwork. So uh, I imagine that most of the people on this call may not be experts in all four elections in uh, Kenya, South Korea, the Philippines and Brazil. So we'll ask a couple of questions that, that can get us all on the same page. Then I'll ask some questions that are a bit more specific to the context of each of those elections. Um, we'll then have at least 15 minutes for, for Q&A, if not longer. So please do type those questions into the chat anytime you like. And then finally, we'll end with a wrap up from uh, Professor Eve Tabergen, who will give us a sense of uh, some of the takeaways uh, from the time that we've spent together. Okay, so with that, let's get into the, the moderated panel discussion so that we can uh, learn from our four panelists. Um, so the first question, as I said, is, is getting us to a bit of level setting on, on each of these four elections. Um, so the question is just, just to tell us a little bit more about which social media platforms or messaging apps were most important during the election in Kenya, Brazil, the Philippines, or South Korea, and how did those platforms actually influence the election? So we'll start with Angela, and then we'll go to Eva, Aim, and Jade. So Angela, take it away. Thank you, Heidi. Um, so I think in in this particular election, um, Facebook, Twitter and TikTok were rife with political banter. Um, now, I know in previous years, um, companies like Cambridge Analytica and Harris Media LLC um, were found to have led targeted campaigns to discredit political candidates and plant seeds of fear um, about electoral violence, you know, knowing our history in 2007. Um, economic downfall and marginalization of certain communities along tribal lines. Now, Facebook and Twitter have been under fire for not doing enough to curb misinformation on their platforms for a while. Um, and they've actually been called out for behavior that seems like it's them being complacent. In the lead up to the 2022 elections, our National Cohesion and Integration Commission actually threatened to shut down Facebook for failing to address hate speech and uh, propagation on its platform. Now, of course, Meta responded saying that they're going to hire more Swahili translators and that they're doing their best to take down videos violating terms and conditions. Twitter, towards the end of the election, started flagging tweets, which could be potentially misleading the public in regards to the presidential results, because everyone was claiming that they were winning. And it was a move that may have largely been driven by pressure from civil society and other people who are doing research on how influencers have been gaming the algorithms to peddle misinformation um, and general accusations about Twitter not doing enough to curb the rampant misinformation that was flying through the platform during the campaign period. Now, TikTok has been the fastest growing in its reach, especially with the younger demographic. Now, unfortunately, a research study that was run by a Mozilla Foundation fellow known as Odanga Madum based in Kenya, found that instead of them learning from the mistakes of Meta and Twitter, TikTok became a, a breeding ground for propaganda, hate speech, and disinformation about Kenya's election. I think they found hundreds of videos just um, uh, online. And we know that Twitter and Facebook have had to make some decisions about how their algorithm works. So at times, Twitter has switched off the trending section. Facebook has switched off group recommendations. Um, during this last election, I think our Twitter feeds were significantly uh, turned down, but TikTok has lagged behind. And it wasn't until the report by Mozilla Foundation was published that they took down hundreds of videos, which had really garnered thousands of views. Um, 
after what was largely a calm voting period, the misinformation machinery did turn gears um, into predicting the outcome of elections. And the biggest fear for many of us was that that activity on social media was inducing a lot of anxiety about the outcome um, with each camp claiming victory before tallying concluded. So that's the lay of the land around the Kenyan elections this time around. Thanks so much. Over to you, Eva. Of course, talking about an election that is not quite finished, but, but tell us what we know so far. Yes, thank you, Heidi. Um, so yeah, we still have uh, for some states and for the main seat, right, the presidential election, we still have another round, uh, which will happen in October 30th, but we've already had the first round. And Many of many of the problems and uh, our evaluation of possible solutions, I think, will be the same after the second round. So I, I think this is a pretty much uh, a glimpse that will turn out to be, you know, that this is this holds probably will hold for the second round as well. So so for us in Brazil, uh, either during elections or any time of the year, WhatsApp is a very influential, a very impacting social network. So. Um, ever since uh, at least 2016, it has been uh, one of the main uh, mediums for um, not only misinformation, but, but election, uh, election time uh, narratives and discourse and political information and political propaganda as well. So, so WhatsApp is crucial for Brazil. It seems that Telegram has increased its role uh, in this election compared to four years ago. So Telegram seems to be on the rise. And uh, for instant messengers, uh, the, main, the, the main reason why they, they pose challenges to elections in Brazil is that, and this might be, the reasons might be similar as you'd see in other countries, right? That for one, they're obscure to the public. So it's, it's messages that the public in general doesn't know are being circulated. Uh, number two, they're hard to monitor for the company itself because of encryption. And, and number three, and this has been a, a huge problem in Brazil, uh, Telegram, uh, WhatsApp, for instance, is susceptible to mass messaging schemes with automating, uh, automated messaging combined with the pur purchase of databases of phone numbers. So this is a very, uh, unfortunately, easy way to use money to reach uh, a, a lot of people sort of flying under the radar of not only uh, the, the, the social network itself, but also regulators. Um, Instagram and YouTube are, of course, the prime media for boosting misinformation that is widely available and public. So it's a different uh, type of misinformation that we see in Brazilian elections in Instagram, YouTube, and all other sort of uh, open uh, networks. Um, it se there seems to be a development similar to Kenya in that TikTok um, as a recent entrant in Brazil and a network that has mostly teenage users at this point uh, is fastly growing and it might be relevant in our next election two years from now. Um, what, what the problem so far is that they, they did draw attention here in Brazil due to so not only uh, TikTok but also Kauai. So both have raised attention due to their lack of effective content moderation action regarding misinformation. So that would be a sort of um, it's trying to put it short, a, a sort of paint a picture of social media influence in Brazilian elections as, as they, st they stand. Thank you so much. Aim, over to you. Uh, thank you. So I'm here to talk about the Philippines election and much of what I'm going to be talk about today is actually based on uh, survey data uh, conducted uh, by um, my colleagues and I um, from the University of Philippines called the initiative Truth Watch, um, led by Professor Aris Uruguay. So in terms of the use of social media, uh, and we conducted a, a representative ex and randomized sample of, of our surveys twice, March and April, right before the May 9th election. Uh, and we find that um, the most popular social media is still Facebook at 56%, um, YouTube at 24%. Um, influencers, this is general social media influencers, 12%, Messenger and WhatsApp, 9%, and TikTok, which is often most talked about in the Philippines election, actually comes to 7%. Uh, two things I'd like to note about our findings. The first is the uh, enduring and oversized influence of television is still um, 
consume relating to election at 76%. And the most important activity um, where uh, Filipinos use television for is actually to watch debates uh, of candidates. And second point, really important, is when asked about um, which platform matters the most to influencing individuals' vote choice is actually still television and not social media. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a that's a fascinating point that I think is also true in many places that we live in a multimedia landscape, and obviously we're focusing on social media, but that doesn't negate the influence of radio, TV newspapers, or indeed the other classic influences we talk about in communications, which are friends, family, and other important groups as well. So lastly, uh, but not least, Jade, over to you. Thank you. Um, so there have been changes in engagement on US-based social media platforms during the South Korean elections, Why Twitter and Facebook have served the key, role, key platforms for a while, and YouTube has become an essential space for political information during recent elections. In my observation, politi politicians and candidates drew uh, immediate attention from followers by using Twitter and Facebook, while right? political commentators, journalists, and social media influencers um, uh, seem to depend more on YouTube channels to set political agendas and spread information during campaigns. Uh, the popularization of fifth generation mobile communication allows the voters to have more audiovisual content on their smartphones seamlessly. Also in South Korea, there is long-standing media regulation banning candidates from appearing on broad media, broadcast media prior to 90 days before election day. This does not apply to online media platforms. Hence, some YouTube channels with millions of subscribers compete against not only other social media platforms, but also traditional broadcasting providers. It is also notable that a local-based messaging app, Kakao Talk has increasingly be, uh, become influential in recent elections. According to um, the Korea Times, uh, this messaging app is um, commanding 87% market share as of last year. So since this messaging, messaging app is one platform for an individual's combined private and public networks, it has become a political battleground in the country where people share information, misinformation, and disinformation. So social media platforms and messaging apps have influenced recent elections in which they have engaged with the polarization of the political divide uh, among voters based on age, gender, and region. So YouTubers during live broadcasting have donations from viewers, and therefore they attempt to deal with more sensational and uh, politically biased the topics for economic purposes. And the messaging apps also enhance the circulation of user-driven information within chat groups. And therefore in these closed groups, people's political perspectives are being retained rather than changed through consistent exposure to this politically biased information sources. Yeah, thank you. There's a couple of super interesting points. I mean, one, I think that even during elections, which we think of as a political moment, there are still economic incentives. Um, and, and also just that South Korea is the only one of these examples here where we have a, a social media app or messenger mm -hmm. that is particular to South Korea with Kakao Talk. Yes. So we might come, mm -hmm. come back to that and, and talk a little bit more maybe about how regulation mm -hmm. may or may not differ when you have a company that's actually based in the country. But let's move then to, to the second of my, uh, what I'm calling sort of foundational questions. So it's really just a Again, help the audience understand some details about how social media impacted the election in each of these countries. So I'm just going to ask you to give uh, an example, if you can, of a, a particularly egregious piece of, of mis or disinformation, um, how it spread, how the social media companies reacted, and the effects of this disinformation if uh, you were able to tease it out, which as we know is a very complex question. So we're going to reverse and uh, go back to uh, South Korea, then the Philippines, Brazil, and Kenya. So Jade, back to you. Uh, so in South Korea, both the progressive and conservative supporters claimed electoral fraud in the 2012 presidential election and 2020 legislative election respectively. So such, such conspiracies were initiated by politicians and opinion leaders and were then shared by supporters through messaging apps, social media platforms, and online communities. 
As a recent example for the 2022 presidential and local elections, the uh, conservative people power parties, politicians, and extreme right social influencers and YouTubers brought in conspiracies about early vote tampering. So although the two main party political parties urged people to participate in early voting, each claiming that high early voting turnout is advantageous for victory, it seems that conservative advocates tend to vote on election day. What matters here um, is the expensive reproduction of conspiracies about which the elections break social trust on national election forms and results. So to minimize this effect of misinformation on elections, local media companies such as Kakao offered a special page that voters could comprehensively check for information about elections. And also the mobile app also has an election tab that allows users to easily check related information such as the status of advanced voting um, um, and also ex exit polls and the status of vote counting by region. And also the report false facts and slanderous post ba banner was introduced to prevent the spread of election related misinformation and enable users to recognize unfair election reports. In terms of uh, the monitoring and deletion of this you know, uh, misinformation uh, related uh, content was not really uh, major issues in Korea. So that could be a kind of issue in terms of you know, US based social media platforms, how they actually minimize the engagement of you know, local election, national elections in South Korea. Yeah, thank you. Aim, over to you. Uh, thank you. So just to, to give a broad uh, perspective about the enormity of the disinformation situation during the Philippines election, Meta actually removed 6 million accounts mm -hmm. on Instagram and Facebook and um, relating to violation of its content policy three quarters of that removals was a result of violations relating to incitement of violence. And the other one quarter, it's about hate speech. Um, and six million is a lot. Uh, comparing to what happened in 2016, where Facebook removed none. Even though um, uh, three weeks prior to the election day, 62% of all Facebook activity in the entire Philippines was about Duterte. Uh, so the, the, the level of, of engagement of Filipinos on social media about elections is extremely high. Uh, but six years ago, you would uh, social media companies didn't do anything and I think they've caught on to that which is something I will discuss in a later point. Uh, just to give uh, a brief um, discussion of one case in particular that is uh, talked about a lot which is the issue of the Marcos uh, rewriting of his uh, Marcos Jr. rewriting of his own father's legacy, basically um, trying to portray him in a different light, that he wasn't a dictator and that, that there was no corruption cases against uh, his family and that um, his uh, mother didn't, you know, basically steal money. Um, and just the way, the way the pieces of information worked is that unlike six years ago, it spread it across different platforms. So there's definitely this, the, the uh, compounding effect of social media users using multiple platforms at once, making it easier, but also harder because, you know, when information goes from a, a Facebook platform to TikTok, now you're dealing with two companies, not one. Uh, and secondly, uh, and very importantly, the you, the rise of micro influencers. So these are people who are trying to gain notoriety or some popularity just by picking piggy banking on uh, a trending issue. So picking on the issue of the Marcos and sees is as an opportunity to uh, be an influencer. And so the rise of micro influencers during the Philippines election makes it really difficult to 
identify exactly, you know, the, the nature of the networks of disinformation, because these are loose agents that are not tied to political parties, that are ordinary citizens, not hired, which is very different from 2016, where you actually had specific individuals who are influencers that have been um, partnering with, or at least used by politicians to gain votes. But the rise of very, you know, basically independent micro influencers everywhere, and picking picking up on the BBM issue of um, the Marcos legacy, really meant that it's really difficult to try to identify, you know, who exactly what is the actual relationship between the candidate and the influencers in peddling this information. And the third point I'd like to make about this is that um, the the impact of uh, this this information is so extreme that when I interview the leader of the BBM support group in Australia, which had nearly 40,000 likes on Facebook, I asked him, you know, what, what, what do you think about the allegation that BBM supporters believe in fake news and are trolling other people? And he said, we don't believe it's fake news at all. We believe that Marco's legacy has been distorted over time. So the, this comes from a le the leadership of a very large support group uh, who grew up during Marco's times and now believes that the alternative truth makes more sense than what has existed in the country. Yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate you bringing in the, the question of the role of, of history, both the, the lived memory of people who lived through something and then have a, a different reinterpretation uh, decades later, but also I think how historical memory and versions of history actually often play a strong role in, in disinformation, which I think, uh, certainly from my historian hat, is, is a very important thing to, to bring to the table. Uh, Ivar, over to you. Um, Thank you, Heidi. Yeah, I just uh, I just want to uh, sort of reflect and react to uh, Aim's description, and uh, I think there's a clear comparison here uh, in Brazil. For the last few years, we've seen an increase in misinformation regarding what kind of political regime Brazil was under uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and at this point, there is a successful, I'd say, to some extent, successful effort, uh, still ongoing, by certain groups of people to reframe uh, something which was uh, a military dictatorship into uh, some kind of democracy that was protected by the military. Uh, so, and, and misinformation has been, has played a role in that. So just, I, I, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate uh, sort of uh, uh, similarity. But uh, for us uh, in the 2022 election, certainly the main topic of misinformation or the main target of misinformation efforts has been uh, the election itself, uh, the voting machines. So Brazil has had uh, uh, automatic digital voting machines for uh, the better part of two decades now. Uh, we've never seen any cases of documented uh, fraud happen, actually happen, uh, even though there is accountability um, and they are not sold by some kind of uh, a shady company. They're actually developed by the electoral court system itself. So it's a very robust system. And, and still we have seen, especially in the last 12 months, uh, an effort by uh, uh, President Jair Bolsonaro, very much like that of uh, former President Donald Trump's, to uh, discredit the result of a pen of a uh, of an election that is to come, where that person is running. So basically, the narrative is, um, you know, the, the people are with me. If the results of the voting machine do not show that, if I if the voting machine says I I lost, then clearly there has been a fraud. And so, President Bolsonaro uh, for for the last year has been actively proactively. Uh, spreading, creating, and spreading uh, misinformation regarding um, uh, fraud of the voting machine. So there are uh, fake videos circulating where you would see a vote being incorrectly registered to candidate A, even as the voter types the number of candidate B. You've, uh, we've seen um, news stories 
news stories uh, of voting machines being taken to a supposed warehouse of one of the political parties in order to be modified. Um, and so this has very much uh, happened with the endorsement of President Bolsonaro. Um, so it has been certainly the main topic. And one of the things that he has claimed is that not only the voting machine itself uh, can be hacked and can be uh, can be used to fraud the results of the election, but also when the results of the election are being tallied up uh, the night of the, the election day, that there's, according to President Bolsonaro, there's a secret room uh, where um, the, the results of the election can be uh, changed by a few people. Uh, so this is some of the claims that we've seen. Now, um, this type of misinformation has found opposition from fact-checking agencies. Uh, it has found a strong counteraction by social media companies. So I would say Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, they uh, have not been remiss in clamping down on misinformation regarding uh, the voting machines and the election itself. And most notably, uh, there has been uh, strong opposition by the Superior Electoral Court. And that is because, as I said before, in Brazil, elections are overseen uh, by the electoral court system. So it's, it's, it's within the judiciary. And so the Superior Electoral Court uh, has uh, been in this dynamic with President Bolsonaro for the, at least the last year, probably the last two years, uh, which has reached a level of antagonism that is, I think, unmatched by any prior confrontation or disagreement between a presidential candidate on one side and the electoral court on the other side. And so the court has actively, in, in specific rulings, it has actively, actively censored posts regard, uh, with allegations of uh, uh, voting machine fraud. It has produced public information pieces, and the court has also established partnerships with social media um, in order uh, for content, for instance, uh, to be automatically flagged as possible election misinformation, and then for that content to receive a sort of pop-up inviting the user to visit the Superior Electoral Court website for election information. Now, the, the, so to sum up and to sort of give you the, the, the result of all of this is that we fear uh, an uprising, very much what we saw after the last uh, presidential election in the United States, um, because of the threats that President Bolsonaro has been making, because in all of the polls, he has been shown to be the losing candidate, and because he was the runner-up in the first round of the presidential election a few weeks ago. So right now, um, I would say there's at least a quarter of Brazilian voters who firmly believe that the elections can be defrauded and, and we are uh, very much at risk of a coup uh, depending on the results uh, of the second round uh, on October 30th. Yeah, thank you, Ivar. That's very, very sobering. And uh, we, can, we can hope that the more pessimistic uh, version of your predictions may not come to pass. It's also, I think, really helpful to hear that that context of, of courts as well um, playing a role and, and also playing a role that interfaces with social media companies, which is um, perhaps quite unlike a whole host of other countries. And, and lastly, that same question uh, to you and uh, Angela about a particularly egregious piece of, of misinformation. Thank you, uh, Heidi. Um, so I think the misinformation industry in Kenya has gotten very, very sophisticated. I know that um, during the campaign period, um, there was a lot just really targeting political candidates um, and what their potential impact on the economy and on different tribal uh, communities would have. Um, but there's one particular one that um, we came across, which was a coordinated campaign on social media to put the academic qualifications of one of the presidential candidates to question. This is Ray Lodinga. Um, there were those widespread distribution of images containing doctored university certificates um, on Twitter and Facebook in an attempt to lower his credibility during the electoral process. Now, this campaign went as far as tampering with the Wikimedia 
or a Wikipedia entry of the university to give a false impression that he was not an alumni. And there was this and many other incidents on social media that drove um, you know, all of these social media companies to collaborate with local fact-checking initiatives, one of which um, was the FUBO initiative that is run by Baraza Media Lab to apply labeling to such content. Um, and the visibility of this label content was also reduced on the timelines of us as Kenyan citizens in order to curb the amplification of this disinformation. Now, I ran an experiment this, well, yesterday in the office and asked a few members of my team the same question, which was the most egregious piece of information that they came across. And it was interesting to note that for the Kenyans in the room, none of us had actually come across this particular instance. But for our colleague who's based in Uganda, who was in Nairobi at the time, his answer was pretty quick and he shared this particular instance. Um, and that points to one of two things. One, either the social media platforms really did kick up their gears or not to clean up our timelines of the fake news, or two, we've become so conditioned to the existence of fake news because of how rampant it is that nothing shocks us anymore. Like there's so many other examples. Granted, we speak from a point of privilege, but that would be that would be my take on that. And then it's also important to note that um, there was also a lot of misinformation after the election itself, um, specifically geared towards the outcome. Every camp was claiming that they'd won. Um, and there were a lot of doctored um, images of what we call Form 34A. So just to give you some a bit of a background, um, results are announced at the constituency level. And that is what produces what we call Form 34A. Now, the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission made it possible for the returning officers at the constituency level to take photographs and up upload that to a public portal where everybody could get um, access to it. And so the misinformation that we saw um, towards the end of the election before the results were announced were around doctored images and doctored results at that constituency level um, from each camp trying to claim that one person or their presidential candidate um, was winning. And we saw, as I mentioned earlier, that Twitter uh, um, did a lot of work just to flag, much like in the Brazilian election, like, you know, link to the uh, formal IBC portal and flag that this could be misinformation. Yeah, thank you. That's fascinating. I think it, it dovetails with, with Ains' point about these being multi-platform campaigns, right? And we've been talking up to this point about for-profit platforms, but of course, Wikipedia can also potentially be uh, manipulated in certain ways while it has um, editors, there's still possibility. And I think that pointing to the way that these campaigns have grown more sophisticated, it's not just dumping one post on Facebook, but rather thinking through the, the multiple modes. So what we're going to switch to now is just I have individual questions for each one of you, just diving a little bit deeper into each one of these elections. And I see there are also already a bunch of questions, some of which uh, have been answered in the chat, but feel free. Now you have 10 minutes while I grill our panelists to put your questions into the chat. And Eva, I'm going to uh, combine together the question that I had for you and the question that's, that's been uh, posed by Danielle in the chat. So um, those of you who might be interested in these issues on Twitter might have often seen uh, that the director of the Oxford Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, Rasmus Kleiss Nielsen, will often post on Twitter that uh, disinformation comes from the top. And Yvonne, you've, you've spoken about this a little bit in the context of uh, Bolsonaro, um, but Danielle is, is curious that, that given that, that Lula is really on the defensive now, um, is his team responding with similar information campaigns uh, to defend themselves. And the sort of sub question was just wondering if elected lawmakers have also been resorting to social media to run on the coattails of uh, Lula and Bolsonaro um, using their names as, as anchors to amplify what they were doing. So basically is, is Lula responding in some way with, with similar information or disinformation campaigns? And are we seeing from other politicians and elected lawmakers um, that they're riding on the coattails of, of these campaigns? So sure, um, I think uh, that would be, I think that that's the most important question, right? Because right now, so not only in the first round was Lula the, the candidate with the most votes, uh, which means which would mean he's in the lead. The, the polls since then have shown that, um, they have predicted that uh, he uh, will uh, win in the second round and become president. So 
he, as you would expect, he has become the subject of um, online attacks uh, using mainly misinformation. Um, what's what's curious about the case of Brazil is that yes, the disinformation in the last four years is has been created and uh, originally posted sometimes at the top or by the top, um, but it also has been shared and actively endorsed at the top or by the top. So either uh, one of these two uh, types of strategies, but by either one of these two, President Bolsonaro has employed uh, methods that are not unlike those of uh, Donald Trump, former president of the United States. Uh, so extreme right-wing misinformation in Brazil is, is mainly planned, curated, and strategically circulated by a tight-knit group of people in a few key networks, such as WhatsApp, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is very well-organized action that has ensured extremely high levels of efficacy and impact, um, as well as, as, as a high capacity to adapt to changes um, and adapt to regulatory intervention or court intervention, right? So it has been resilient. Uh, extreme right-wing misinformation efforts in Brazil have been have been proven to be very resilient. Um, as it was uncovered by an investigation conducted by the Brazilian Congress um, uh, in the past three years, um, this, this is a group that has been called the Cabinet of Fear uh, because there's evidence that even members of the Bolsonaro administration directly participate in this type of strategic action. So um, at the helm sort of is uh, a, a small, relatively small number of people such that this is not dispersed, this is strategic. And so it does not disappear uh, in white noise. It has been heard, this has resulted in significant voter manipulation and, and most importantly, as I said before, in allegations of voting machine fraud, but also of uh, poll fraud, of, of um, uh, voting uh, poll fraud. Um, so I would say that this cabinet of fear has been instrumental in creating and circulating distrust of election polls. Now, what has Lula done? What can any candidate who is running up, uh, running against Bolsonaro and this well-oiled misinformation machine do? Um, so for the most part, uh, it has not, Lula's campaign strategy regarding misinformation, online misinformation has not been to proactively educate the public and trying to uh, overcome misinformation uh, with accurate information. It has been mainly so far two-pronged. So one, they go to court um, and the electoral court system in Brazil uh, is, you know, it's um, judges are uh, trigger happy in terms of producing rulings that will censor political speech for one side or the other. Uh, what's very curious is the last presidential debate with Lula and Bolsonaro that we had on Sunday, at one point, Lula mentioned a, um, a story regarding Bolsonaro. And the first thing that Bolsonaro did was pull out the text of this ruling from the electoral court that had banned Lula campaign from uh, publishing and circulating that story. So both of them are uh, using courts as much as they can. And then the second strategy that has, I would say, I mean, it's obviously very early to evaluate and to tell, but the second prong of Lula's strategy has seemed to be fight fire with fire. So of course he's not doing, he's not uh, getting his hands dirty himself, um, but a few politicians, uh, most notably um, a guy named uh, Janonis, uh, have been in charge of producing and actively uh, um, circulating fake news, which is either left-wing or extreme left-wing fake news against Bolsonaro. And this has created, uh, I mean, this is obviously unfortunate, but this has been one of the two types of strategy that Lula, Lula's campaign has engaged on. So I, yeah, that, that, that would be a sort of uh, what Lula is up against and how he has fought it so far. Yeah, thank you so much. That's that's very helpful. So we're going to switch gear and, and Jade, ask you then to, to bring in all of this work that you've done on pop culture in, in South Korea. So how have those studies um, influenced your understanding of media use during the, the recent election? So um, have we seen that a popification, so to speak, of, of electoral information has affected opinions, votes and indeed the, the outcome of the election? 
Oh, you've got to unmute. <laughs> yes. So thank you. For, so my previous works uh, examine the political dimension of fan parties for patriotic culture and practice because of the stiff competition among K-pop idol groups. Their fans have strategically developed numerous fan activities uh, to make their celebrities powerful in the market. So as shown by North American fans of K-pop idols such as BTS, these fans enhance the media visibility of K-pop idols through um, uh, various fan activities, uh, including collective streaming of music and purchasing uh, bundles of new album or seats for national awards. So this type of you know, idolization of uh, politicians and the fandomization of voters are manifested in the South Korean political sphere. So supporters produce various media content to shape the candidate's intimate public images and voluntarily uh, monitor online com uh, communities and portal sites to manage positive comments or uh, correct the misinformation. So former president Park Geun-hye or Moon Jae-in had their own solid fandom. So these cases tell us that developing loyal fans matters with regard to winning uh, elections in Korea now. And my current research is to examine if K-pop and K-drama fans can construct their political power for national elections in a more direct and active way. So in the case of the current Minister of Justice, although he's not a politician, everything related to him, accessories, eyeglasses, pens, and et cetera, were sold out by his fans. According to recent surveys, he has emerged as a political leader, uh, um, um, next uh, leader for the country. So, um, and he, interestingly, his fandom was initiated by an, an online forum uh, for Korean dramas. And he spends mostly former K-pop idols and celebrity fans, fictionalize his characters and also dramatize his personal stories. So by producing numerous fan art, music videos and online content as they did for their you know, uh, idol uh, stars or uh, actors. So uh, given that Korean fan culture has been developed in the past three decades, um, these fans learn how to politicize their media activities. So it will be very interesting to observe if these fan groups, rarely recognized by political parties, would make some impact on future elections in South Korea. Yeah, thank you. That's fascinating. Uh, this mm -hmm. this merging of uh, fan yes. culture networks, but then moving into and bleeding into politics in, in really... Yes interesting ways and we've also seen I think the the transnational influence of, of K-pop mm -hmm. fans I remember anecdotally right the the story of K-pop mm -hmm. fans uniting to uh buy buy tickets to go to a Donald Trump rally so there's yes. that also yes. that very interesting international dimension of yeah. um, younger mm -hmm. people unite through their their love of K-pop Angela I'm going to move to you and ask you if you could tell us a little bit more, maybe a, maybe a slightly more positive um, question, which is just, just asking if you could say more about how tech companies in Kenya have innovated in response to all of the, the disruptions caused by technology that we've been uh, talking about and whether those tools have, have also um, affected opinions and, and votes. Absolutely. And I'll start off badly talking a little bit about our own work. Um, I think it's important to think about this from the perspective of the issues surrounding the different elections. I mean, if you compare each of them, 2007, 2013, 2017, and the 2022 one, um, you, you can see a, you know, a natural progression um, of you know, either certain things going down or others going up. So in 2007, I think that bubbled up significant issues around trust in the electoral process. That was probably the, the straw that broke the camel's back, um, as well as hate speech offline and online as a tool for inciting violence. And of course, following that, many tech and non-tech interventions have focused on ensuring that the electoral process is running smoothly and that we're also working to eliminate hate and, hate and dangerous speech and trying to create um, aspects of peace. And 
this is actually the genesis of you know Ushahidi and the work that we've been doing around elections. We run a project called Uchaguzi, which is a customized version of our open source platform that makes it easy for people to collect data via different streams, SMS, email, Twitter, WhatsApp, and USSD. Um, and we use that as a way of monitoring the general elections um, by helping citizens protect their votes in a three-part strategy. One is you mobilize them to share information about um, election uh, irregular electoral practices. Um, two is you liaise with responders on the ground to make sure that we are receiving credible information. And three is we close out the feedback loop to ensure that action is taken if need be. And so that's a model that we've applied in every single election, setting up the platform, making it easy for people to send in text messages or send in tweets or emails about what's happening around them. And that we have a solid network of civil society and other response partners in case um, something happens to make sure that we can actually respond to that. Um, and we noticed that this year, uh, we actually received an upwards of more than 90,000 reports, some of which were not published, of course, as compared to the previous two um, elections, which is an indicator that people have improved agency to use tech tools to document and directly report the issues that they're seeing in their communities. Um, that said, I think, in 2013 and 2017, um, it became increasingly clear that the other threat to Kenya's democracy is actually the misinformation industry, that we seem to be getting progressively better at, you know, running elections on election day itself, and that a lot of the action is happening before, during the campaigns, and, and right after. And so the other thing that we noticed this year is that there were a number of fact-checking initiatives that came into play, not only helping to debunk myths um, and the misinformation and disinformation that was running around, but also trying to take it a step further by trying to teach people how to detect misinformation uh, themselves. For example, I mentioned before the Baraza Media Lab ran uh, an initiative called Fumbua, and we partnered with them to try and flag misinformation on our platform and on social media platforms. But I know that there was also a lot of work um, being done with local community groups, um, whether it was on WhatsApp or trying to run focus groups to help people um, figure out how to detect that. Other organizations like Mvalendo launched initiatives such as Know Your Next Representative, just trying to help Kenyans um, better understand who their candidates were, what their manifestos are like, um, and specifically with, you know, with, with accuracy at the location level. And this, if you compare that with previous years, that's information that's been rather difficult to find. So we're seeing a lot of tech companies also just trying to make it much easier for people to interact um, with political parties at, the, at, at a localized um, level. Now, whether social media influence the outcome of elections this time, that's something that I, I'm not particularly sure of. I can definitely attest to the machinery that was set forth to influence the outcomes, um, but that's still something that we're yet to um, to dig in and do more research on. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm really glad that you also bring up the question of even providing voters with sort of basic information about candidates and their manifestos, because even regardless of thinking about the, the question of online mis and disinformation, what we often find is that voters are, are potentially quite under-informed or uninformed about the, the policies that are being put forward. And we know from a huge amount of research that lots of judgments made in elections are not necessarily about uh, manifestos. So I'm really glad you, you brought that point in. So I'll turn, uh, last but not least, before we dig into some of the questions, uh, to AIM, which is really, I think, bringing in a little bit the, that point that you made at the beginning about um, television still being so important. Um, but I want to ask then, I think, if you could just talk a little bit about whether you think that social media did fundamentally change voters' opinions and, and outcomes, or was this profound change of views on the history of the Marcos dictatorship perhaps related more to uh, the passage of time or other factors. And then if you don't mind, I'll also bring in uh, the question from uh, Samantha, who's asked you if there is any connection between uh, the trend of misinformation and rewriting of history um, and the broader loss of press freedoms in, in the country, for example, uh, around uh, Maria Ressa's uh, arrest. I have one important point I'd like to make with regards to the role of social media in the Philippines elections, and that is the role of social media in influencing voters' behavior is overestimated uh, and, and overly talked about. And, I, and that's based on our research in 2016 and 2022, based on our surveys and interviews, uh, that 
basically suggests that social media is a place to amplify voice uh, in, when it comes to voting choice and not a place to recruit new uh, voters. Uh, this is a place where people who already decided who they're gonna vote for scream at other people or you know, talk really loudly about who they want to vote for. It's not necessarily a place where you change someone's mind. Uh, and that uh, matters when we think about what we need to do with social media during elections. Uh, and I think it goes back to uh, the factors that drive this information, which I see across Southeast Asia, and that is inequality, socioeconomic inequalities in particular, because in our survey's data, it shows very clearly that the strongest correlations to trust in information found on social media relating to elections is income. Not educational level, but income. And particularly in the case of the Philippines, it's young people who go to university but are not making a lot of money. And we know from the rest of the world that this is basically the group of people that are most likely to rise up, right? If you're young, you've tried to do your best, right? Then you're being told if you go to university, your lives will get better. You go to university, your lives start getting better. So, you know. How does this information make ways to people's minds? I mean, they may confirm existing beliefs about the world that they already have. So I think that when you look at social media's role in influencing voting outcomes, um, we we believe based on our studies that they're quite limited, but they amplify existing beliefs that they have in terms of you know injustice and fairness. And this kind of discontent opens up for possibilities for them to be more receptive to this information. Um, our surveys show quite clearly that people in the lower income and um, a lower income are also more open to trusting information on social media. Uh, so the to answer Samantha's question, the level of press freedom in the Philippines, especially online freedom, has been going down consecutively since Duterte came to power. In fact, prior to the election of Duterte in 2016, the Philippines was the only country in Southeast Asia that had um, the internet environment ranked as free, according to Freedom House. But since then, it joined the rest of Southeast Asia to have partially free or not free internet environment. And so, um, in you know, in terms of Maria Ressa is a high profile case, but Philippines is still today the more the second most dangerous place for journalists in the world, second to Mexico, still to this day, and worse for women journalists. So I journalists broad terms, you know, traditional journalists and online journalists, and in our research report that um, I, uh, I did with Luminate uh, Foundation and Sembra Media, where we look at the journalist safety across the entire Southeast Asia, the most at risk type of journalists in Southeast Asia is photojournalists just by the fact that their job is to take photos. So I just want to, to make a point that the, you know, persecution of Maria Ressa is an outcome of increasingly uh, illiberal press and illiberalism in, in Southeast Asia, and in fact, in, in uh, sorry, in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm so glad that you, you raised the point about um, what we know from studies about the effects of online social media, which are indeed often to cement people in uh, what they already believed, or in many cases, um, they're more about turnout than they are about changing people's minds as to which party they might be voting for, which, as you say, is perhaps a different dynamic than is often talked about. There was a question in the chat was about what is the bottom line for Canada, which I'm sure um, people from Canada are interested in. And I think that is one of the bottom lines is that it's important to look at the research that actually really teases out these effects because there are all often assumptions that, that end up being flawed and, and you've pointed to uh, some of them. So we're gonna move and answer some of the questions that were individual. I see um, lots of you have been answering in the, in the chat, the panelists, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move to Sam's question, uh, which is a, a broader question, which also gets us uh, towards solutions and then let uh, whichever one of you wants to jump in to jump in and, and Sam says uh, really great information so far thanks to, to all of the panelists and asking if 
you have come across any measures other than content moderation and that have reduced people's susceptibility to misinformation. So, Amy, you mentioned questions of inequality, but if there are other measures that have reduced people's uh, susceptibility to uh, misinformation. And as many of you have pointed out, when the false information is coming directly from candidates or parties themselves, um, it can be difficult to see how moderation can keep up. So I'll, I'll throw that open to uh, whichever of you wants to jump in and, and take, a, take a stab at, at what else we can do other than content moderation. I'll jump in. Um, one of the things that social media companies can do, and it's quite cheap to do, is to provide a uh, content policy in as many lang languages as possible. Um, so I've, I've, I've been working with Meta for quite some time. And one of the things we realized is that a lot of the frontline people of hate speech and disinformation are actually the Facebook um, uh, group admins. So they're in charge. They're basically like the online version of community leaders, right? They basically see hate speech first and see bad content first. Uh, but uh, in our interviews of um, a civic organization in Southeast Asia and as well as India, um, we find that none of them have actually read the content policy of Facebook. <laughs> and particularly, it's a language issue. Um, they need to have as many versions in as many national and sub-national languages as possible. For example, in the Philippines, Visaya, uh, which is a language in Mindanao, is spoken by 16 million people. But, you know, that, and we find in our uh, in our tests of uh, hate speech is that the Facebook algorithms actually pick up hate speech in Tagalog much higher than hate speech in Visaya and worse when they're used together, which is how most people talk. They switch, the code switch, they use different English, Tagalog and um, another dialect at the same time. So if they can provide uh, not just policy in as many languages as possible, but also online free training tools conducted in local languages that would really empower and give the knowledge for the very people who see bad content all the time and can't understand what's hate speech, what's not hate speech, and what to do. This is something free and could be really effective way of empowering what I call the hate keepers, the gatekeepers of hate in uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah, thank you. And I just added to the mix that the Behan Thai from Access Now has made similar points about Ethiopia, right? So we see this is a much more general problem of, of which languages um, content moderators are trained in or if terms of service are even provided in certain, as you point out, extremely uh, major languages. So we'll take uh, one more of the, the questions here. I'll do a wrap up question, then we'll be handing over to Eve to Bergen. So this is this is a question about um, Latin America. So to you, Eva, um, this is a question from uh, Hadja, who is wondering um, how much of the, the political disinformation that we're seeing in Latin America may be influenced by examples like the late Hugo Chavez and his movement in Venezuela, despite, of course, the ideological differences from Bolsonaro. So I think um, that that's a, a very good point uh, that, uh, and I agree with it, that uh, we see uh, politicians today in Latin America, uh, especially South America, in the left and in the right, using a, a few of the strategies that we've seen Chavez use before. Um, he would have uh, mass media um, at his, as, as his main tool and very long uh, speeches, the tools are somewhat different, but the strategies are very similar. And uh, maybe the reason for this, well, there are probably multiple reasons for this, but um, one thing that, that we can see in common in terms of uh, uh, South American politics is that South American voters have a sort of a, a sweet spot for the sort of a messiah figure of the politician who's going to be the one that solves all the problems. So the idea that if you concentrate power more than uh, more than any other solution, more than uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, gradual improvement coming from Congress, uh, 
Rather, if you concentrate power and if you give a lot of power to this one person who is going to save everyone, uh, that's the best way to go. So that that might be behind uh, the reason why Chavez was able to do what he did. It might be behind the level of popularity that Bolsonaro has achieved. And it turns out that uh, even when you don't have mass media, even when you're in a country where I think is the case in Brazil, and this is a comparison um, to some of the uh, descriptions that have been made regarding the other countries, certainly in Brazil, uh, social media has been influential. It has been the most influential means uh, of communication in, in the last two elections, um, more so than TV, I would say. So even if you don't have mass media, you can still explore this sort of uh, uh, dictator complex uh, that some of the voters might have and and get them on your side by creating these narratives about how centralizing power is going to be the best answer. Yeah, thank you. And I think it speaks to what some other scholars have also talked about, which is when social media narratives resonate, it's because they resonate with people's deep stories about themselves, their countries, their lives, et cetera, exploit them in some ways. So there's a lot to learn from, from thinking about those questions. All right, one final question for all of you. You have one sentence, one sentence, um, to give us your top piece of advice to social media platforms about how best to operate during elections. So we'll start with uh, Jade, Aim, Ivar, and then Angela. Jade, one sentence. You've got to unmute. <laughs> So when being asked this question, I, I'm not sure this is feasible uh, or achievable advice, but I'm just, anyhow, I'm going to say, so I believe the social media platform should find a way to increase information flows across divided groups, rather than intensifying the circulation of information within the group, one group. That's I'm kind of thinking, but I think it's too desirable. But, yeah, <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Drop it there. Hey, one sentence. Be the influencer. They should be more fun and entertaining if they want to give out messages about what to do, what not to do in election. Do it like what they what influencers do, their own platform, uh, even it's TikToker. Just be fun and engaging. No one wants to be lectured on how to follow their elections. So be like the K-poppers. Eva, one sentence. Yes. <laughs> So in one sentence, I would urge uh, social media to publish an ad library made up exclusively of the ads, the content of which has been picked by fact-checking fact agencies to check. So it's a very filtered down version of the ad library. So this would enable the public to crunch the numbers, find the patterns, and then cover the abuse of algorithmic mm -hmm. advertising. Yeah, thank you. Angela, last but not least, one sentence. Oh, God, I'm a really good people to make it in just one sentence. <laughs> um, pay attention to adherence of your policies and guidelines, even in markets that you deem to be res less relevant than your main areas of focus. That means investing in resources to better understand politics in those areas and how your social media platforms are being used for harm. Burying your head in the sand will not help. Please let me leave you with this quote by um, the Mozilla Fellow based in Kenya. This idea that you can just build a social network platform from your cozy office in Silicon Valley or Beijing or anywhere else and have it spread around the world without it having any consequence on society is wrong. It's a pipe dream. Thank you very much. That is a wonderful extra sentence uh, to add. So I will be passing over to Eve to Bergen to provide closing remarks. But before I do, I want to thank all four of you. I have learned a uh, tremendous amount. I really appreciate it. I think the contrast of bringing all four of you together has really highlighted the similarities and differences in these uh, four places. So thank you all so, so very much. And now I will hand it over to Eve Tabergen to wrap us up with some closing remarks. So that was amazing, truly awesome. Um, and I think it shows how you know how much we lack behind the understanding of uh, you know of social media and the election. Uh, you know, we have uncovered so many things tonight, and yet uh, there's so little, you know, of the mainstream election study, there's so little focus on that. I think another theme tonight is the enormity of some of the campaigns that are going on. I think we have found that information flows are at risk. They're up for grabs, and that they're the essence of election. We have also found that narratives that change the human minds are being uh, constructed very fast. 
and with enormous human impact. And then we have also found that, at least in Brazil, but in some other places, uh, there is a battle for the very legitimacy of elections uh, that's going on through the social media. We have learned that this is a multi-platform uh, process, quite complicated, and it varies by countries. Uh, in some cases, economic incentives are very powerful. Um, the effects, however, of social media on the actual individual elections, for some of them, we don't know for sure. Uh, we can see massive general effects uh, on information and narratives, but we don't always, we have heard different views here. Uh, in the case of Brazil, it could be among the most dramatic one, and we'll see uh, in October. But we do see that it's reinforcing beliefs, it's reinforcing polarization, and it has impact on turnout. Um, a, a final point is we have seen contrast between organized top-down campaign or, or strategic action through social media uh, in the case of Brazil and more decentralized through individual grassroots players who try to uh, become famous in the case of Philippines and maybe in the case of Korea uh, with a lot of business uh, involved in the case of Korea um, and I guess in the case of Kenya. Um, in, finally, we have heard about the responses. So the most amazing part is from civil society, and we learn a lot uh, from Angela in Kenya and from everyone here, from Ivar, from AIM, on a lot of actions. But it's a matter of speed. In a way, the future of election at this point is an equilibrium, and it, it depends on the balance of power, the balance of action between very uh, aggressive politician on one hand and then civic action and platform reaction on the other hand. Uh, and so, and that equilibrium seems to be shifting every year and in every place. But uh, clearly the elections themselves are up for grabs in that triangle. Um, we also learned that in a way, when you think of it, Facebook started with this simple dream of someone trying to connect people uh, from his garage in the Silicon Valley. And now we're finding that it's affecting uh, political, the political future of every community on earth in every possible language and sub-language. And the company is not equipped for it, right? And there are very few companies involved. So there's this awesome, or this astonishing mismatch in a way uh, between what the initial idea was and the reality on the ground. Um, so with this, um, I want to make a plug for our December 6th event, which will be at 5 p.m. like tonight. It's called Mind the Gap, Digital Trade Explosion versus Fragmented Data Governance. So we want to see this contrast between this immense flow of data that's now driving globalization to a large extent and the fact that there is no common governance and is very fragmented and contested. We will have top scholars and analysts from Japan, Korea, Singapore, as well as the US and Canada, and with examples taken from around the world. Um, I want to thank you, Angela, especially for staying that late, uh, Jade, Aim, and Ivar, as well as my dear colleagues, Heidi, Pantea, Tanya, and Rashi for an awesome event tonight. Thank you. <laughs>